Hey yo, what's up everyone? How are we all doing? Um, back with another video. This is a video I've been actually looking forward to doing. I saw it in the comments not too long ago. Kind of back when I done the other History of Japan. That was a lot shorter than this. And um, from then it, it's popped up a few times and you know, a lot of you know I've got a fascination with Japan. You know, the Japanese people I've, I've met. I love the people and my dream is to go to the country. So, here we are. Learning about the animated history of Japan. Um, let's just get straight into it. It's a long video anyway, so let's not waste no time. This episode is supported by Skillshare. Use the link below to learn for free for two months. This limited edition enamel pin is a... Okay. Early Japan is shrouded in mystery, pottery and tools left over by a mysterious prehistoric culture known as the German, who were mostly hunter-gatherers and occasional farmers. But soon, there were newcomers, the Yayoi from Korea, who fought with strange shiny weapons and planted tons of rice. These people would form more and more small villages. So I take it that from this is when Japan was connected to the rest of Asia. I don't know where we've started in history here. Just slowly displacing the German and creating a fishing community culture, which obviously extends into Japanese cuisine today. Traditional Japanese beliefs focusing on spirit, deities, and complex rituals also began to coalesce, and formed a usually related group of beliefs we now call Shintoism. These yayoi soon formed a loose pseudo- Is that like Shinto Buddhism? Just an earlier form of it, Shinto Buddhism. Usually related group of beliefs we now call Shintoism. These yayoi soon formed a loose pseudo-monarchy called the Yamato period, which gets its name from the Yamato clan, the richest and most powerful of the Japanese clans. And the period is usually divided into two eras. The Kofun era, named after these giant, awesome keyhole-shaped burial complexes, had heavy cultural contact with the Korean peninsula, through which they adopted the Chinese writing system. The idea of an emperor to unite the Japanese islands really took off during the Asuka era, which coincided with the spread of Buddhism in all that Chinese writing, okay. and the Japanese were soon to experience a sense of shared identity. Evidence of this can be found in this adorable letter from the Japanese emperor to the Chinese emperor, in which he addresses himself as the emperor of the land where the sun rises, and the Chinese as okay. the emperor of the land where the sun sets. And then he said hello. What? Is that like the prologue then? Oh, is it just taking us around the rest of the world? Okay, okay, that was like a prologue. With pleasantries out of the way, the Japanese began sending diplomats and envoys to China to learn about its customs and culture to bring back to Japan. And boy did it absorb a lot of Chinese culture. Not just writing, vocabulary and architecture, but also less tangible things like customs, philosophy, religious piety, and an imperial court-like system. Okay. The Yamoto clan even experimented with land collectivization, with the aim of curbing the power of rival clans to the imperial throne. Just be careful with that. Yeah. The emperor moved <laughs> his royal court twice, from Asuka to Nara, and then from Nara to Heian Kyo, naming an era after each period. But it was basically the same time period, I don't know what all the fuss is about. The one we will focus on is the Heian era. It's hard to overstate just how important the Heian period is to the history of Japan. The period saw a rise in an aristocracy interfering in Japanese politics, bordering on an oligarchy. Okay. Noble families or clans held great control over the imperial government, such as the Taichikana, Minamoto, Taira, and the Fujiwara clan even held a significant regency over the emperor with the title of Daijo, mostly by extensive marriage ties to the royal family. As you can imagine, these clans fought constantly with each other, such as in the Hojin Rebellion, where two branches of the Fujiwara clan supported two different emperors, which was so devastating it led to the Heiji Rebellion between the Taira and the Minamoto clan, made more confusing when you remember that some of these emperors were often cloistered or retired. It just goes to show how much power and influence retired emperors still held in Japan, yeah. and how that power could be leveraged in a civil war. Both clans could claim the moral high ground, claiming that they were fighting for the emperor. Do you see how complicated this gets? Let's take a break and look at how things are going outside the capital. In the north, the Japanese are fighting with the Amishi, a frontier German yayoi mixed population whose guerrilla warfare and horse archery was a real pain in the ass for the Japanese. 
The only way they were able to defeat them was by copying their Mishi horse archers and tactics, leading to the first heavily trained military class in Japan's history. Japanese soldiers before this had mostly been Chinese-style cloned peasants who barely knew what a spear was. Okay. But after the Amishi Wars, they were samurai. Right? Okay, that answers some questions there. Because I was wondering, like, what is the Japanese military looking like at this point? Y yeah, I'm still... It took me a second to kind of catch up to, like, where we were in J Japanese history. Obviously, it's got the date up in this corner, but... I thought it was going to start a bit sooner on. And... If I'm not mistaken, the samurai were originally bodyguards for individuals, like for rich people to have as bodyguards, and then there were so many samurai that they kind of formed together to form the military. Beat them was by copying their Mishi horse archers and tactics, leading to the first heavily trained military class in Japan's history. Japanese soldiers before this had mostly been Chinese style cloned peasants who barely knew what a spear was. But after the Amishi Wars, they were samurai, highly specialized warriors in the martial arts an honor-based warrior class called Bushi. Their leader became the Shogun, roughly equivalent to a general in English. And okay. anyone so that's the Bushido fighting style slash lifestyle. Their leader became the Shogun, roughly equivalent to a general in English. And anyone who knows anything about these guys knows that they become super important later. So what did these samurai do when they found themselves out of a job? Well, some became bandits, but many of them were hired swords. Nobles used samurai as personal guards and to collect taxes, and farmers hired samurai to protect them from their nobles who were there to collect taxes. <laughs> Rinse and repeat. Powerful clans emerged and soon the samurai became more and more united, basically pulling the strings and dominating many parts of Japanese society, forming agreements, overseeing trade, conducting raids and administering taxation. Remember those conflicts in the capital? The samurai fought those wars, and when the dust settled afterward, it was clear that they held the power not some dude in a chair somewhere. Yeah. The samurai class were reaching their peak of influence around the time of yet another clan war, but this one would prove to be very different because it ended up toppling the entire political system. The Minamoto clan defeated their longtime rivals, the Taira, and with their newfound power, the emperor granted Minamoto no Yoritomo the title of Shogun. But make no mistake, he ruled Japan now in the first Shogunate, or Bafuku in Kamakura. The emperor was now merely a figurehead. So what made the shogun rule different? Well, rule was delegated to regional stewards called Jito and governors called Shugo, who ruled in the place of the shogun. In addition, a regent was appointed over them called a Shiken, usually a member of the powerful Hojo clan who had come to prominence by allying with the Minamoto. Right. So much prominence, in fact, they even became rulers of Japan and the shogun became the figurehead. So if you're keeping track, the emperor was a figurehead for the shogun and the shogun was a figurehead for the Shiken. This was feudal Japan. Social mobility ceased. You were either born powerful or you stayed powerless. Okay. So under this new system, were things peachy? Short no. answer, no. In 1221, the cloistered emperor Gotoba rose up in rebellion against the Hojo clan in the Juku War, which did little more than get himself banished and show that the Hojo clan were no pushovers. The Hojo Shiken presided over Japan's new faith, Zen Buddhism, to help them unite their domains but they also had the very unfortunate duty to have to deal with Japan's first ever foreign invasion. Drum roll, please. It's the Mongols, Mongols. because of course yeah. it is. is As you'd expect, Kublai Khan wasn't too thrilled having an empire to his east and immediately, although politely, asked Japan to submit to them in a tributary status over and over and over again, but to no reply. The Khan then did what Mongol does best, invade. In 1276, the Mongols landed in Japan and waited on their ships overnight to attack the next morning. However, being on a ship is kind of the last place you want to be if, say, I don't know, a typhoon. Is this the Takeda clan? I recognize that symbol. However, being on a ship is kind of the last place you want to be if, say, I don't know, a typhoon was to hit. <laughs> and that's exactly what happened. Huh. Neat. Yeah, convenient. Again, the Mongols invaded six years later, this time with more ships and a larger army. But the Japanese managed to hold them off using extensive preparation, fortifications, and a brand new weapon they invented called the Katana, which was extremely effective against Mongol armor. Even so, they were taking heavy casualties. If only another typhoon would come and rescue the Japanese from these foreign <laughs> barbarians like it did the first time. And that's exactly what happened. 
Japanese philosophers and religious leaders were so perplexed that yeah, a typhoon had imagine. saved them again that they even named this strange phenomenon the divine wind or kamikaze. And ah, thinking it must have been. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That's where the term kam kamikaze comes from. Strange phenomenon the divine wind or kamikaze. And thinking it must have been sent by Japanese spiritual deities, a newfound resurgence in Shintoism emerged. Famously citing. If I had a nickel for every time a typhoon destroyed the Mongol fleet, I'd have two nickels. Which is not a lot, but it's still weird that it happened twice. <laughs> the Mongol invasions, although failures, really rocked Japan's political system to its core, which allowed an emperor to briefly regain control before his former ally, Ashikaga Takauji, turned on him and seized the shogunate for himself. Because that's how mafia works. It's time to play a game of unintended consequences. Remember those Shugo governors from the previous shogunate? While the shoguns and the emperors were off busy fighting one another, the shugo basically ruled themselves. They were no longer shugo, but daimyo, warlords. So, if you're keeping track, the emperor is a figurehead for the shogun, who is a figurehead for the daimyo, who really have the control over Japan. The only thing that could make this situation any worse would be another civil war. Which is exactly what happened. Jeez, you know, Japan. <laughs> you know, we can't knock modern day Japan, because they're one of the greatest nations on the planet. But Jesus Christ, feudal Japan, you guys could not stop getting at each other. <laughs> you guys have been killing each other for hundreds of years. That's probably why, you you know, you're fucking it. You're doing so well today. He's like, we, we need to stop fighting each other. Because, you know, modern day Japan, their production, technology is just unreal. So, it's probably got all the fighting out of their system for their... Uh, for the foreseeable future. The Hosokawa and the Yamana both supported two different claimants to the shogunate and this ignited a powder keg all across Japan. Daimyo started fighting one another for control, fracturing Japan even further, and the whole social hierarchy crumbled, creating a power vacuum. Small clans subjugated larger clans, rivals turned allies and allies betrayed and invaded. You name it, they did it. The era was so profoundly violent that it even became known as the Sengoku Judai, the Warring States Period. It was near constant warfare, made more devastating by the implementation of these weird Portuguese hand cannons called <laughs> Tanegashima, but today we just call them guns. It was also a period of extensive espionage, with the daimyo spying on one another, assassinating each other and You know, Total War really done well to pick this this era as like the Shogun 2 like main campaign, right? Because you couldn't have got a better place. You know, with, with a relatively medium sized island, with so many individual clans that it's kind of like a potent mix. And cannons called Tanegashima, but today we just call them guns. It was also a period of extensive espionage, with the daimyo spying on one another, assassinating each other, and betraying one another constantly. These spies are what we now call ninja, and were so instrumental to the period that they became romanticized by European authors, who were absolutely fascinated by Japan. While watching from a safe distance away, of course. Yeah. How can you not be fascinated though? Just even as animated as this little scene is, you know, look at the architecture. You've got the blossom trees here, you've got the cool ninjutsu outfits. It's just, Japan, throughout its history, for me, it's just unreal. One clan under Oda Nobunaga looked at a fractured map of Japan, famously stating, well, this won't do, and decided it was time for Japan to unify. Okay, so that's a little creative license, but the result was the same. The Oda very narrowly won a battle against the Imagawa clan and cemented the Tokugawa as allies in the process. And an alliance in this day and age was bad news for the other daimyo, who distrusted each other far too much for any alliances of their own. In the blink of an eye, the Oda conquered the Saito, Miyoshi, steamrolled over the Azai, Asakura, and the Ikoiki before repelling an invasion from the Takeda. It seemed that the only way to stop Obunaga was to assassinate him. But even this backfired when his steward, Toyotomi Hideyoshi, just continued the conquest in Oda's name. <laughs> when his army got bored, he just decided to let them invade Korea, which really wasn't a good idea because one, they lost, and two, they decimated their army in the process. So when Hideyoshi died, his former ally Tokugawa Ieyasu seized Japan and was crowned Shogun. Which was easy to do since Ieyasu hadn't lost any troops in Korea, and thus was the only one in Japan with any real army. With one last battle against Toyotomi Hideyoshi's son at Shikigahara, the Tokugawa Shogunate was born. The Tokugawa then did something so drastic it gives new meaning to the term overreaction. 
The disastrous defeat in Korea left such a bad taste in their mouth that the Shogun closed Japan. No foreigners could enter, and no Japanese could leave. Except for the Dutch, they're okay I guess. Round 2 of Unintended Consequences Remember in the China episode how the Ming and later Qing dynasties had become isolationist after they finally overthrew the Mongols? Well, Japan, the other power in the region, had just closed their gates as well. And thus, the two most powerful empires in Asia did basically nothing around the time the Europeans were bumping around Asia colonizing things. There was literally no great Asian nation to balance out the trade, influence and conquest the Europeans were doing. How interesting would it be if we had like an alternative history where Japan and China didn't close and in fact made a military alliance to combat the incoming European powers? Because you know, war back then wasn't like it was today. I don't think Europe would have... If there would have been resistance here, it would have just ate so much resources, I don't think they would have bothered coming back. Like, it's not like you're flying, you know, for anyone that's just been on the Midway series. You, you know, you can't, you're not getting back and forth as much. There's no way you're supplying troops as fast as we can today. So, this would have all been, you know, Asian through and through. It would be interesting to see what effect that would have on the modern day world. Would... China and Japan be bigger superpowers than they are today, or bigger powers than they are today. In the 16 to 1800s, meaning that Japan and China became extremely marginalized, sitting on the sidelines, turning away traders and decreasing their foreign interactions. We already know how this story ends in China with the Europeans basically crushing the Chinese and seizing trade monopolies. So how were things going in Japan at the time? Well, the Edo period is seen as pretty peaceful and prosperous albeit because of the extremely strict caste system introduced by the Tokugawa, social mobility and uprisings just weren't feasible, and the only ones with any weapons in the country were the samurai, who were paid handsomely by the shogun to prevent misbehavior, and they basically became glorified bureaucrats. But as time wore on, the isolationism started to show some flaws. Firstly, the Opium Wars shocked Japan when they saw the dominant Asian power, China, dominated and humiliated by the British. And secondly, a widespread famine. A skyrocket in the price of rice coincided with this famine, creating a brand new wealthy farming class. After all, the farmer really is king when the people are hungry. This completely upset the entire social order, and this new class had just gotten a taste for social mobility. And yeah. hey, it didn't turn out so bad. What was the government worried about? But everything should still be just fine as long as Japan keeps its doors closed. Yeah, I was waiting for that. Oh uh, no. That's the last thing you want to see. The US Navy really, arrived in Japan in 1853 to end Japan's closed country policy, commanded by Commodore Matthew Perry. No, sorry, <laughs> not that Matthew Perry. Crash Course already made that joke. <laughs> the Americans were motivated to open Japan to open up a trade sphere in Asia, to protect their shipping and whaling industry in the area, with just a sprinkle of Manifest Destiny thrown in there as well. So, using gunboat diplomacy, the Americans open up trade with Japan. In other words, open up or we'll shoot you. The inevitable opening of the country happened, and this infuriated the daimyo. How could the shogun allow the Americans to humiliate them so badly with such an unequal treaty as happened in China? The same year the trade treaty was signed, Japan was rocked by two devastating earthquakes and tsunamis, which just felt like a bad omen. Yeah. So, what did the Japanese ruling class do? modernize. Remember that small Dutch trading port we talked about earlier? For centuries now, Japan had had this seedy underbelly of studying Dutch literature, smuggling books in and out and creating an underworld network of studious and enlightened figures. So these enlightened and progressive nobles were shaping up to fill a power vacuum when Japan was on the brink of revolution. Who would deliver that revolution? Calm down, I'll tell you, it was these guys. They planned to overthrow the shogun and restore the emperor to power. In the Boshin War that followed between the two sides, the rebels proclaimed the appointment of Meiji, or enlightened rule, to bring Japan into the modern era. The deposition of the shogun and the restoring of the imperial court had once again rocked Japan to its core. And thanks to that period in time, we have this beauty of a film. See this right here? Beauty of a film. Don't know why I've got it on DVD. That's how much I like it. It's on Netflix now, so I got it on DVD as well. Yeah, so this is when like the modern, like they started taking out all the samurai. There's some horror stories, absolute horror stories. I can't remember what book I read, 
but there is a book based around this time and it was from the perspective of a young boy which grew up in kind of like a, a rural village um, having seen the samurai well I say uh, young the boy's about 12 13 having seen the samurai in and around and then like the kind of sweeping of the new modern soldiers coming in and you know the battles that were near his his village that kind of took place and how the families it kind of split families apart like some were modernists some were traditionalists and it just absolutely tore the country into not physically but kind of like politically I guess out with the old and in with the new new economy new trade new western style government manufacturing science and medicine even Edo was renamed to Tokyo factories and trains popping up everywhere Japan was entering an industrial revolution a century after the great powers and at breakneck speeds largely thanks in part to those Dutch bookworms here we see a major difference in how the Japanese and the Chinese isolationists had responded to outside pressure while the Qing dynasty had fractured and collapsed into the warlord era, Japan had unified, embracing 19th century nationalism, devotion to one's country, modernization, and industrialization. With it, of course, came the dark side of such ultranationalism as well, like a pretty serious superiority complex which the government was all too happy to stoke. At the time, this was seen as the only way for Japan to maintain its independence, especially during the 20th century arms race but it slowly morphed into a prosperity fallacy. We must be doing so well because we're better than other people. This would come back later. <laughs> Japan's massive military started looking outward. Projecting Japan's might was the only way to ensure her own security. No one wants to end up like China, humiliated and crumbling in civil war. Their massive military annexed the Ryukyu Islands and then astonished the world by going to war with China and winning the first Sino-Japanese War, taking control of Taiwan and occupying the dagger pointed at the heart of Japan, also known as Korea. And then just four years later, the Japanese helped put down the Boxer Rebellion. The world barely had time to pick up their jaws from the ground when Japan defeated Russia in a war for dominance over Manchuria. Hey man, that is a serious headlist, isn't it? Like you know when like fighters want to get all the good names under their like under their sheets and beat this guy, beat this guy. Japan went and took out China and Russia within what is that like a, a 30, 40 year period? That is insane. Yeah, imagine you was on the other side of the world. You you, you know you kind of used to hearing about how big China or Russia is and little old Japan is just modernized and is absolutely whooping everyone. That's crazy. Later, the Japanese helped put down the Boxer Rebellion. The world barely had time to pick up their jaws from the ground when Japan defeated Russia in a war for dominance over Manchuria. This brand new Japanese army had just won three wars against two major powers in the space of a decade. You'd kind of forgive the Japanese leadership for thinking this ultranationalism stuff was working. The victories in the Far East had set Japan up as a regional power and it wasn't long before they formed an alliance with the British who shared Japan's hostility with Russia at the time. But when the First World War broke out, the Japanese found themselves on the same side as Britain, not fighting the Russians, but the Germans. No, not those Germans, these ones, mm -hmm. right here. Germany didn't really have much capacity to protect Tsingtao and so of course these areas became integrated into Japan as well. But the victory became core to the building of German-Japanese relations. The German soldiers were so impressed with the Japanese army that they openly admired them and even showed them a sign of great respect as they paraded through the city, hmm. while turning their backs on the British soldiers when they entered. The most notable outcome of the first war- You know, I never knew that. That's very interesting. I wonder if there's any more literature on this. That's very interesting. Admired them and even showed them a sign of great respect as they paraded through the city while turning their backs on the British soldiers when they entered. Fuck. The most notable outcome of the First World War was Japan dethroning China as the Asian superpower. They had responded to the European threat, adjusted accordingly, and now they had the military victories to back it all up. Their alliance with the British and the West in general slowly began to sour as the other allies in the Entente failed to show them the proper respect they thought they deserved. It's not surprising then that interwar Japan is where things get a little messy. The military continued to protect its influence in Manchuria, eventually invading the area in 1931 after fabricating a Chinese attack on one of their trains. And when the international community- Hey, whoa, 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 that's not proven. 
That was never proven. We need to throw some allegedly's in here. That is alleged. We don't know that. <laughs> Let's get a little messy. <laughs> The military continued to protect its influence in Manchuria, eventually invading the area in 1931 after fabricating a Chinese attack on one of their trains. And when the international community in the form of the League of Nations condemned their actions, the Japanese delegates responded by simply <coughs> leaving. The Japanese Fair. ambassadors thought it was pretty hypocritical of the Western powers to prevent Japan from forming an empire when they had vast empires of their own. You know, you can't knock Japan's logic here. Because they're just mimicking exactly what the the Europeans have done. And even though Japan did do some unforgivable things like the rape of Nanking, you know, European powers have been guilty of similar things. I don't know, to the extent of the rape of Nanking, because that was brutal. I don't know, that that's that's something that you could just talk until the cows come home. That's, that's up for debate, obviously, but, you know. You know, the, the European powers are just making sure that like they've kind of got Asia. Asia's there. Like Japan's looking after it for us. But when we've finished up over here, we can go over there. And Japan becoming more and more powerful didn't kind of fit that narrative. So you know, I think later on when Germany and Italy were seem to seem to be rebelling against the popular narrative of the European powers, I think that's why Japan liked it. Plus, they all had this egotistical nationalist persona about them anyway. And obviously that, that played into it. Especially when Japan had such huge economic ties to the region and were battling the Great Depression, same as everyone else. This underlying feeling of hypocrisy should sound familiar to what was happening in Germany and Italy at the same time, and how these three nations dealt with coming comparatively late to the empire building game. Of course, this is just one of the many underlying causes for what happened next. But diplomatic isolation, very much added to the superiority complex. Other nations are simply jealous of us. So as the Chinese Civil War raged on, the Japanese were finally ready to assert themselves against their historic rival and invaded China in yet another fabricated incident. With their entire military might, they barreled down on the Chinese mainland, fighting both the communists and the KMT in a united front. However, the war became something far more hostile as the Japanese began committing atrocities from the rape of Nanking to the extremist treatment of prisoners of war. So you're covering Japan, huh? Good luck with your monetization. Tell me about <laughs> it. The Japanese war culture was heavily honor-based, and so they treated surrendered armies with malicious contempt. The rape of Nanking was so brutal that it sours relations with China to this day. My pal Knowing Bitter did an amazing video on this if you haven't already checked it out. But if it weren't for the German Holocaust and the Red Army rape of Eastern Europe, then this would be remembered as the most brutal atrocity of the Second World War. I mean, that just goes to show how bad the 20th century was when the rape of Nanking kind of come third in the atrocities committed that century. You know, a name of a century where the rape of Nanking wouldn't have been first. Um, yeah, although the, the rape of the Eastern Europe what I don't they don't call it that but what the communists did to Eastern Europe isn't talked about enough uh, the rape of Nanking is briefly mentioned in name in British education it's like yeah and the Japanese rape Nanking and when you hear like Nanking's a city in Japan rape that you kind of put two and two together but it's only brushed across in name and the Holocaust is really focused on um, why that is is you know, I have some suspicions as to why certain things are left out, why certain things are put in, but that's for another conversation. But, yeah, it's crazy that, that that's third. Europe, then this would be remembered as the most brutal atrocity of the Second World War. Yeah, the comments on that one are interesting. Through territorial expansion and an ideology of superiority, Japan soon found a friend in Nazi Germany and joined the Axis powers in 1940 officially intertwining the European and Asian wars into the Second World War. Invading and taking control of British, French and Dutch colonies while Germany and Italy were attacking the British, French and Dutch at home. The Japanese are now largely remembered for their attacks on Pearl Harbor, but what is often left out is that the attack was part of a larger operation. Uh, if you haven't seen them, I've already covered a whole series on the Japanese perspective on Midway and Pearl Harbor, so go check them out if you want. Italy were attacking the British, French and Dutch at home. The Japanese are now largely remembered for their attacks on Pearl Harbor, 
but what is often left out is that the attack was part of a larger operation, attacking both the Americans and the British holdings in the Pacific, but which had the consequence of bringing the United States into the war. In hindsight, this is seen as a bit of a backfire, since the Japanese were now fighting a gargantuan four-front war. But this just goes to show how invincible the Japanese saw themselves. Even so, the Japanese were brutal occupiers and fought to the death to defend their conquered territories. With some of the bloodiest conflicts in Burma, where a quarter million of the casualties were civilians, or in Okinawa, which had the highest American casualties in the Pacific. However, no one would fare as badly as the Chinese, with the second highest casualties of the entire war at the hands of the Japanese. Between See, that's crazy that's not talked about. You always hear about the 6 million Jews in the Holocaust. You never hear about 8 million Chinese people murdered. I think we briefly touched on it in uh, The Fallen of World War II. It's a video I reacted to maybe a month ago or so. 8 million Chinese. You, you know, when you think of the highest casualties in World War II, you wouldn't even suspect China to be up there. You know, you'd think, uh, you'd think Germany, you'd think Russia, Poland, you know. China... It's kind of well, me personally, I am. Uh, I'm slow to remember that China's price of the war between eight and twelve million people, mostly civilian. Even as Italy and Germany were occupied, the Japanese just kept fighting. Even with the U.S. leveling cities like Tokyo, it took two of humanity's most destructive weapons to get them to surrender: the atomic bombs. That's right two bombs. The Americans even warned the Japanese that a second attack was coming, calling it the most destructive explosive ever devised by man. These brand new nuclear weapons were so devastating that they leveled these cities and the radioactive fallout would cause deaths and health problems for many years to come. And they left such a bad taste in the world's mouth that to this day, they are the only nuclear weapons ever used in warfare. What makes the Japanese war atrocities so noteworthy is that Japan didn't have some hostile domestic takeover preceding it. There was no fascist or totalitarian regimes like there were in Nazi Germany or the Soviet Union. Japan had simply become more and more aggressive internally since the days of the Meiji Restoration, with little to nothing to stand in their way. It was only when coming into conflict with the neighboring Americans and British Empire that Japan stopped expanding. The post-war economic miracle and pacification of Japan is very much intertwined with the American involvement in Asia during the Korean War and the broader Cold War as a whole, and we will probably cover this in another video. But what is particularly bizarre about post-war Japan is how education about the war in Japanese schools worryingly reference the Second World War as a defensive patriotic war, rather than one about their own military aggression. We can argue at length as to the validity or relevance of this historical narrative until we're blue in the face, especially since Japan is such a friendly, popular, and non-hostile nation today. But there's no denying its noteworthiness. And education is really important. It can shape the way we see our past and build our future. Understanding the motivations for the Japanese Empire, as well as the complex geopolitical and geosocial history, can help us frame our world and our lives more complexly. It is important to keep learning and improving our minds even long after we leave school. If you want to learn how to make an animated YouTube channel. Okay. So that was really interesting. Um, it didn't, I thought it would touch more on like post, post-war Japan. And that is basically when they had just a modern revolution, like, you know, technology, cars, DVD players, consoles, games, animated series, cartoon, the lot. And, you know, as a result, they're one of the best economies on the planet. And in my opinion, one of the best countries on the planet without actually having been there. Um, it was interesting. You know what I was thinking about during the course of it? Check this out. I have no idea what's going on. I'm sorry. Imagine. Okay, so imagine Japan took all this before joining World War Two. The, the official start. Wait, no. We're a bit late on here. Uh, uh, I'm trying to think. Okay, I can't find it. But let's say Japan never joined World War II and stayed with these territories and kind of just settled down and said, right, this is ours now and we're going we're gonna to enjoy it. I wonder what Japan would look like today, what position it would be in. Would it have inevitably got wrapped up in World War II, which I assume it would have, but you don't know. Do you know what I mean? It's just interesting to see if you know certain decisions were made, how that would have shaped today. But... um any Japanese people in the comments, definitely, definitely let me know. 
what you guys are taught about in school because I have no idea, obviously. My audience is largely American and I'm sure they'd be interested to hear as well. But, uh, yeah, let me know. I hope you've enjoyed the video, man. Go, uh, subscribe to this guy. So, I can't even say that name. Yeah, like, comment his video, obviously. He's done all the work here. I just reacted, man. Um, and if you want to, like, comment, subscribe on mine, much appreciated. I don't know why I've done the fonts and, hey. Uh, but yeah, peace out guys, take it easy, and I'll see you tomorrow.